We're going to be picking up in Numbers 13. And Numbers 13, our text is, our main text is going to be here. And we're going to start off in Numbers 12 because I want to give you a little preface of what's to come. Amen? Now, when I say amen, you say amen. amen. When I say amen, you say amen. amen. In Numbers 12, the people that were close to Moses, and Jasmine alluded to this, the people that were close to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, they were grumbling against Moses. They were grumbling against their leader. They're like, does God only talk to Moses? Aren't we Israelites? Aren't we his people too? What's up, Moses, leader? They started grumbling against their leader, y'all. That would never happen in the Phoenix church. That one, the Phoenix church is so godly and so holy that you would never grumble against your leaders. Surely you would never grumble against your discipler. You would never grumble against your shepherds. You would never grumble against your house church. You would never grumble against your evangelists. Surely not. Got a little quiet here. What's, what, what's up, man? We got to talk or what? They were saying, isn't God with us also? Grumbling against their leader. You see, you see, God was getting a little perturbed here. He was building up. He, he, the people started ticking him off a little bit. Like God was not very happy with what's been going on with the Israelites. They started to lose a little bit of faith. And their faith become in the, turned into form of grumbling. You guys with me here? I didn't write it, guys. You can look it up. It's all there. And so what happened, God is very serious. He goes, okay, you want to mess with me? You want to mess with my people? Let me help you out here. Boom, leprosy, Miriam. And then the Bible says, Moses, Moses, Moses. The Bible says that Moses was the most humblest man in the world. So full of humility. And the Bible says he wrote that book. <laughs> but amen. <laughs> Some people believe Joshua was his scribe and wrote it. That's another text. But, but he, he wrote, it, it was allowed that he was the most humblest man that ever lived. And he goes to God, he says, God, I know we're some jacked up people here, just like we are here in Phoenix, but can you give them some grace and mercy, please? Like, then they're going to be talking about you saying, God, that you, you, you freed them from slavery. You took us out of the Red Sea. You did all these great things. And they're going to talk bad about you. So can you just have some mercy here, Lord? And God said, okay, Moses, because you ask, but there's going to be some consequences. She's got to be put out for seven days because of her leprosy. You see, God don't play around. That's not even our main text. I'm just giving you a to how God's heart was at the time. But God don't play. You with me here? God don't play. In Numbers 13, point number one, have faith. God has done it before. Have faith. God has done it before. Numbers 13, verse one, the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran. All of them were leaders of the Israelites. There were 12 leaders from the 12 tribes of Israel. Are you guys with me here? So he goes, okay, remember, this is coming from God. This is, this is Moses carrying out the plans of God here. See, a lot of times we think in the spiritual realm and church and, and Jesus and everything we do, we think that, oh, our leader's doing that. Uh, no, God is asking for it. God directs this church that you're in right now. I just get to serve in it. Hello. Are you with me here? Your leaders just get to serve in it. It comes from God here. Verse 17, we're going to drop down because we're not going to go over all the names. You can go back and read up on those if you love the lineages and so forth. I know Jason McNeil probably memorized them, but. Amen. He probably does too. Huh? Twelve tribes. That was Gad and okay, Rubens and okay. Love you, Jay. Uh, when Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, "Go up to the Negev and on the hill country, see what the land is like. Whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not?" Do your best to bring some of the fruit of the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob toward Libo Hama. They went up through the Negev and came to Hebron where Hamin, Sheshi, and Talmi, the descendants of Anak lived. Hebron had been built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. When they reached the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. 
Two of them carried on a pole between them along with some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes that Israelites cut off. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. So they went out. It's kind of like they went from the desert to San Diego, y'all. Good weather, some water. They're probably like, wow. Because he told them to go. He didn't tell them how long to go. They made it into an extended vacation, y'all. 40 days. They're like, ooh. And it wasn't like they were hiding in there and spies. They were just with the people chilling, just observing, like, okay, what's up here? What's going on here? You see what I'm saying? And Moses gave him directions. He's like, you got to check this out. Check that out. Make sure for this. How is it? Ooh, ah, eep, op, or ah, ah, what's up, right? That's not speaking in tongues. Don't worry about that. They came back, verse 26, they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh and Desert of Prime. So they come back and everybody's like hearing, they're waiting to hear the words. They're like, what's going on? They're fired up again. We're going to get the word of the Lord. We know what's been promised. What's up? What's up, guys? What's up to our 12 leaders? You with me here? There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and show them the fruit of the land. They're like, ooh, look how good this looks right here. That's a good mango right there. Them are some good grapes. Verse, I don't know if there are mangoes. Verse 27, you would be tripping. People come up to me after church. Hey, bro, I don't think there was mangoes there. Okay, all right, I, got, I, I digress. Verse 27, I got to have some fun, amen? Verse 27, they gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. That place is awesome. There is milk there. We can drink something different. It's awesome. It's honey. There's preservatives. It lasts. It's beautiful. It's awesome. It's great. It's an incredible place. But the people who live there are powerful. And the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. Our enemies are there. The Amalekites, our enemies are there. Live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites. All of our enemies are there. They live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live there near the sea along the Jordan. They're everywhere. Our enemy is everywhere. They're everywhere. Verse 30. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him, so there was two faithful, Joshua and Caleb, and the other ten were like, well, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they explored. So they went and just told the people, man, it was nice, but it, it, we ain't going there. Man, it was beautiful. You should have seen it, but don't go there. We'll, we'll, get, we'll, get, we'll get annihilated there. You guys with me there? We're seeing how big this picture is here. Verse 32, and they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they explored. They said the land explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there were of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak came from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Here we have two realities, faith and fear. Caleb and Joshua were responding in faith. Everything seemed like God was in control, and they remember what God had done for them. They remembered and they knew they were serving a mighty God and that he could do whatever he wants and anything he promised. A God that never goes back on his promise. But the additional 10 that went out, they were not so faithful. They listed their challenges. They believed that they couldn't conquer and they were outmanned. They were grasshoppers to them. They looked like they were, they looked around, they go, we're little. And then to the, to the people there, they go, let me a little grasshopper, a little fleas there. You see what I'm saying there? We can't defeat them, they said. Because these reasons, they didn't want to do what God told them to do. Faith versus fear. Where have you been lately? Where have you been living lately? Although the reality is true to them, and some rightly so, Joshua and Caleb were faithful. They would conquer what is in front of them from God. The facts are, they were faithful over their fears. The facts in your life today, some facts are real to you today. Some facts today are, how is your marriage today? 
Is it big and great and grandeur? And like, oh my gosh, how am I here? Oh my gosh, how am I here? What happened to us? This big monster that I've created in my marriage is so big now. How am I going to fix this? You guys with me here? Some of the facts are in our life is such as a cycle of decisions we made over the years. It's coming back to haunt us. How about the facts of the sin you keep running back to and can't let go of? Right now, some of you are thinking about those sins right now. Like, is he talking to me? How does he know? How does he know I keep running back to the sins? You guys with me here? How about some of the facts of sin in your life and you feel like you can't change? How about the facts of this? It's, this is just how I am. I can't change. How about the facts of this, Phoenix? Financial struggles. Can I get a witness from the congregation? You with me here on that one? Yeah. Facts of being lonely without a spouse. Facts of getting older, not feeling effective. Facts of doubt and fear. These are just some of the facts, Jack. Some of the giants in our lives that seem unconquerable to us. Am I the only one? I'm preaching to myself on this one. I was like, oh, man, I got some, I got some things. To I'm scared. I have some fear in my life. I have some fear in my life for my family, my children, my life. I have fears. How about you? Can we be real today? Can we talk about the giant and the fears in our lives that are prevalent? Can I make this? Can I be a disciple? Can I last? Can I, can I make Jesus the Lord of my life forever? Is this really going to happen? Is this real? Ooh, 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 ooh. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11.1. You, you can go back and go to it. Don't trip. Hebrews 11. What is faith? What is faith? Hebrews 11 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. There's two key words here. You see this. One is confidence and one is insurance. Confidence in the Webster's Dictionary means the belief or belief that one can rely on someone or something, a firm trust. Assurance, what does that mean? A positive declaration intended to give confidence, a promise. So faith is believing in the promises of God fully. If God says it, I believe it, that's that. Period. Period. Don't we say that? If God says it, I believe it. Well, if, if, if it's in the Bible, I'm going to follow it. If, if it's really from God, it's in the Bible, he says it, I'll do it. You with me here? Then why don't we? Can I get a witness from the congregation? Why don't we do it? Faith is believing without seeing. Faith in the Greek is pistos, to some pistos, amen, I'm not a Greek scholar. But it means to persuade or be, persu be persuaded by what is trustworthy. It means to be faithful. And we need to believe in God because he's shown us things. Has he not? God has worked in all of our lives. The fact of the matter is our faith comes, guess what? We woke up today, hello. We got some air in our breaths today, hello. You with me here? Y'all going to eat later on. It's going to be okay. Don't worry. Church is a little bit later than normal, but you're going to eat. You're going to be okay. And if you don't have food, you can come on over. We can share some top ramen together. It's all good. You're going to get something to eat. But faith is God is working faithfully in our lives all the time. We need to believe in what God has shown us. When we are faithful, we're able to see what God wants to use us in. To see, we can, to see that we can conquer all things through Christ. You with me here? One day, one day there was this mountain man way up high walking down a windy road. Out of nowhere, a man on a horse comes charging at him, jumping out of the way, almost getting smashed. From the dust on the ground, the man yells, where are you going? The man on the horse turns around. And he says, I don't know. Ask the horse. The horse can represent our fear sometimes. Our doubts, our past, our bitterness, our pain our lack of love, you name it. We can be led by our fears. We can be led by our fears rather than control them. You guys with me here? 
And people were like, how's it going? I don't know. I got this, this, and this going on. How's it going? I don't know. I got this, 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 and this going on. You guys with me here? We can be led by our fears. And I'm telling you right now, guys, it's time to take back what is ours. It is time for the Phoenix Church to conquer our fears. It is time for this church to have faith over fear. But I know, I know this. I know this. I know that the Phoenix Church is a practical church. Y'all like practicals. You're like, okay, well, how do I do it, bro? How do I do it? What do I do with my arms? How do I hear, I hear you and I agree. How do I do it? Okay, I'm going to teach you here. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Let's use the Bible. Amen. Let's use the Bible. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Here's what I believe is one of the cures to conquer our fears. Amen. The Bible teaches in verse 5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets us up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You've got to take that sinful fear and you got to go, no, no. This is not godly. This is not going to get me anywhere. And you got to go, I serve a mighty God. I am an overcomer. You do that. You see, you do that individually. It's your responsibility, not your disciples, not your house church leader, your Bible talk leader. The Bible says, you take captive your thoughts. Because guess what? As the ghetto boys say, your mind is playing tricks on you. Some of y'all got that, some of you didn't. Don't worry about Paul. Paul Grover, you all right? Bum, 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 bum. Paul's like, what? You guys with me here? Take captive our thoughts and make them obedient to Christ. That means we don't have to be led by fear. That means that we can be faithful to God. And when the odds are stacked up against us, the Bible says the Lord goes before us. We can rely on God's promises. After all, in Romans 8, doesn't the Bible say that God is working for the good of all of those that called us to his glory? The Bible says that God is already working for the good. As long as we love him, we're obedient for him, things can be crazy, whatever, whatever. But the Bible says God's working for our good. Hello? God is working for the good. It doesn't seem like it, though. It seems like we're little grasshoppers. We're little ones. Hey, I, I, oh, I can't do it. It's too much. Oh, Lord, this, one's, this is the big one. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that because I've been there, y'all. I've been there. I've been like, oh, man, this. I don't even know. This is a big one right here. They don't even understand me. Man, they don't, they don't understand. Nobody gets me. It's just me and you, Lord. Nobody gets me. Why do you put this one in front of me? Give this one to Christian. Let Chris Burdick handle this one. This one's too big. You guys with me here? We can get like that, right? We've got we've to capture those times. We've got to make them obedient to Christ. If you don't capture them, you don't make them obedient to Christ, here's what's the next, the next thought process. It's just me. Maybe I'm mental. Maybe I have mental deficiencies. And listen, guys, we're fighting a satanic war here. We're fighting against these spiritual demons. And it's no wonder why the church here is getting hit by stuff. Because guess what? Satan does not like what's going on here. You should not be surprised that Satan is coming against us. Just so you know, it sucks, but I'm not shocked. All the stuff that's going on, I'm like, man, this is this. But guess what? It's to the glory of God that he, he thinks you're somebody to be dealt with. Are you guys with me here? Yeah. We need only to be faithful to God and God will see us through. Amen? Challenge, guys, is to conquer one thing this week. You know, I've been challenging my, my, my guys, my friends. I've been challenging them this thing because it's, it's challenging to me. And I want to challenge the rest of the congregation. Practically speaking, we're jacked up people. Amen. Practically speaking, we're sinners. Amen. Practically speaking, we mess up all the... God, can we just get it right? Right? Here's the good news. You can be victorious. And I believe if we do it like this, it's been helping me. So I want to preach and teach from what I know. So this is what's been helping me. I want to share with you. It's God's. Amen. I want to challenge the church 
to be victorious in whatever sin you're going through. Pick something that you have a hard time with. And guess what? Be victorious minute by minute. Be victorious hour by hour. Be victorious when you hit the bed, you go to sleep, you're fired up, you've been victorious for that day. You wake up fired up again, you do it again. Minute by minute, hour by hour. Do it for the week and watch the glory of God be revealed to you in your heart. And guess what? You just start to feel better. You're like, if you're struggling with forgiveness, you go, I'm going to be a forgiving person this week. You struggle with impurity, I'm going to be as pure as the driven snow. Struggle with anger, whatever you go. No, 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 no. You're not getting me today. No, 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 not today, snake. Minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. Amen. Amen. Point number two, faithful friends helping us overcome our fear. First Corinthians 15, 33, the Bible says, do not be misled. I believe it said don't trip today, but amen. 2023 version, Stacy. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Moms know this one right here. Like, don't be hanging around with them. Don't be hanging around. Ooh, no, no. Cochina, cochina, cochina. Cochino. Right? 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Bad company corrupts good character. Don't get it twisted. You are who your friends are. Are you influencing your friends or are they influencing you? There's an old proverb that says, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. And this proverb, you know, it sticks like this. It's like friends that birds of a feather flock together. So if you're doing some dirt, they're probably going to do some dirt with you too. Are you with me here? It's important to be influenced by godly men and women. Hello, they're your friends and they're also your family. But we also got to be influenced by Jesus. Can we get a little Jesus this morning here? Let's get a little Jesus this morning in Luke 5 here. We came to see Jesus this morning. Amen. Came to worship the mighty God. Amen. Let's see what Jesus says here. Luke 5, verse 17. I love this. This, this right here. I love God's word. I'm, I'm very grateful to preach it. But when I'm reading this by myself in my office, I'm like, ooh, ooh. Do you get like that? I came out last night, I'm like, Christian, ooh, ooh. Are you with me here? Luke 5, 17. One day, Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up to the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles and into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friends, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves. They said to themselves, selves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. These are some good friends, y'all. I don't know if this man was faithless, but he couldn't move his body, the scriptures teach, right? I don't know where he was at, but he must have done something right with some friends like that. He must have had the gift of gab. You feel me? Like, he must have had some pretty powerful words. His friends go and help him out. And you know what they did? They had to inconvenience the crowd, first of all. Because everybody was trying to get to Jesus, and here they are pulling this guy up here. And so what they had to do? They had to inconvenience the crowds. And sometimes, family, we got to inconvenience some people. We have an agenda as God's people to move the movement of God. And sometimes we got to inconvenience some people. And sometimes we got to inconvenience our own people. Like, oh, should I call him? It's 10 o'clock at night. I really need to talk. Call him. (laughs) Should I really ask this sister to study the Bible? It's only an hour prior. Call them. We need to inconvenience some people. To get people to Jesus. Are you guys with me here? Listen, 
if that person's bothered by it, they may not be filled with the Spirit. Hello. And then guess what? Generally, when they agree and they do it, they get closer to God like, I'm so glad I did it. You guys with me here? So we need to inconvenience some people, right? And guess what? Y'all don't have a problem inconveniencing me. You call me all the time. So why don't you do it with each other too? You with me? They knew enough to inconvenience the crowd. We've got to make a serious effort to bring people to Jesus sometimes. And then they cut a hole in this man's roof. They cut a hole in the man's roof, y'all. I, 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 this is in the Bible. You got four dudes picking a guy up, going through the crowd. And you know when you take cuts, that ain't cool. You know when you're at a concert, somebody gets in front of you, you're like. Or you're in line and somebody takes a cut at you at Starbucks, you're like. You got to be godly, but you're in your heart, you're like. These dudes are taking cuts, y'all. Cut the dude's roof and then lowered him. Can you imagine we're in service like this? All of a sudden, you hear a, a, a buzz saw up there. And the dude's like, everybody's just like, wow. Wow. And then Jesus goes, what great faith. What are you doing? So Jesus says to you, what great faith. What are you being victorious in your life right now where Jesus goes, what great faith. You with me here? A little quiet. Got a little quiet right now. Got, I mean, either it's being convicting or. Uh, wasn't even their house, y'all. Man, don't try that at Chris's house. <laughs> the safe will get opened up quick. <laughs> He's got some new friends in there, too. I'm just I'm not saying nothing. Okay. And yes, there were some haters there, right? You're going to hail on the Sabbath? You're going to do it like this? There's some haters there. It should not surprise you that haters are among us or near us. Isn't it interesting that people are always in our business? I see, see this. They're doing this. And ooh, look at the way he turned right. Look at how he's joking up right now. Look at him now. I don't like the way he said that. Ooh, and they did this. They're, they're watching right now. I don't like the way they're doing that. Mm. Why? What are you doing? Mm-hmm. It's, it's in the Bible. Jesus was preaching and teaching, and there they were. right. He allowed, they would be right here right now. Right. Just. You guys with me here? Should not be shocked. We should not be shocked that haters are going to be haters, right? If you're following Jesus closely, it happened then, it's going to happen now. But check out verse 26. The Bible says that everyone was amazed and gave praise to God, filled with awe. They said, we've seen remarkable things today. And I asked the Phoenix Church, are you amazed at what God is doing in your life today? Are you giving praise to God filled with awe? Because guess what? We are seeing remarkable things. Are you giving praise to God being filled with awe? Are you being filled with God and going, wow, what's going on in this Phoenix Church is amazing. Are you fired up to see the new people that are worshiping God right next to you? Are you going, are you look at these new disciples and you go, wow, you've given your life up to be with Jesus. First of all, are you crazy? And secondly, it's good to have you. Do you look at these young disciples and go, this is remarkable. Because we know what it takes to give up everything for Jesus, do we not? Are you in awe of God bringing people to worship God with you here? Are you in awe of the 36 baptisms and 11 restorations we've had in the last seven months? Are you in awe that God is moving in his church in Phoenix? God is doing remarkable things here in the Phoenix church. I'm going to end it with this story here. There's more, but it's getting late. Next time, we'll go a little bit shorter. Last September... Two daughters were praying for their mom. And the mom was a little religious and, you know, had some seeds planted in her, but she wasn't a disciple. And these two daughters would pray for their mom and family all the time. And the mom had studied the Bible in the past before, and she, uh, she just didn't go for it, you know, whatever. And the thing that scared her most as she started to study the Bible again is, is she was afraid of the commitment. You make a commitment to God, it's real. It's not just a pinky promise. It's like, I'm doing this. 
And this woman was, she was a little afraid of what her husband would think or, and the challenges that come with not being home on Sundays and the commitment that is, 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 is asked of us as Jesus because Jesus wants everything, everything, right? And so she was a little challenged by the commitment. And she's like, wow. And then she understood what God had done for her on the cross. She's like, wow. And I remember there was a lot of inconvenience to Lynette and myself, amen. But the daughters were very persistent in getting her to God. Like, we, she needs to be a disciple. She's going to be awesome. And Lynette and I got involved in the church. It was awesome. And I remember we got to count the cost with her. And you know how I get when it comes to that. I'm like, are you sure about this? Can you do this? And she's like, no, I can't, but I'm going to. Because of what Jesus has done for me. And she's been through some struggles. She's only a baby still. She's just been baptized last September. She's been through some struggles. Life happens, family, and even people in the church. Hello. You mean even people in the church hurt her feelings? Yes, they did. But she goes, bro, I'm here. I'm here for God. I'm here for his people. I'm here. And that's Nettie Cruz right there. <laughs> that's her daughter, Lanasia, right there. Her and her daughter, Nichelle. This woman here has made Jesus the Lord of her life. And in spite of all the obstacles and the huge challenges in her life, and just like we have all these challenges as disciples, and God has put these great things before us. In the scriptures, the Bible says that Jesus says in Luke, he says, Simon Peter, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not grow weary. He didn't pray for his circumstances. He prayed for his faith. He knew that he was going to go to the cross. Peter was going to reject him, come back, and later himself be killed. And for us disciples today, we have a lot going on, do we not? There's some things that are so great for us, and all we see is the challenges. But I'm here to tell you, and God is here to tell you, we serve a mighty God. We serve a, God, a conquering king that goes before us. And all you have to do is surrender to it. And if you have that friend that brought you to church today, and it's, it's, you've been thinking to yourself, self, it's time. I've been messing around for so, so long. It's time for me to get right with God. There's never a time where it's perfect, just so you know. You never go, well, now I'm ready. Now, No, you just do it. And today's the call for you to do what is right before God, to be bold. And when somebody goes, hey, let's study the Bible, you go, I'm in for it. I'm in for it. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah. Hear the lion roar. To God be all the glory. I love you guys very much. <laughs>